We want to continue with art of the Rhineland um, in the first half of the 15th century. And here is a painting by an artist who is known only for one painting, for this painting. Uh, it's the Magdalene Altarpiece by Lucas Mosier. Uh, the only thing we know about him is from the inscription on this painting. It is in a church in Tiefenbrunn in Germany. And Lucas Mosier has painted the exterior. So these are looking at uh, the exterior. This will open up and uh, we'll see something else inside. Uh, it is dated uh, in the inscription, 1431. And it has the most remarkable inscription. Um, it is a verse, of course. Uh, we're translating it here. Uh, but it translates something like, Weep, art, weep, yourself deplore. Weep, art, weep, yourself deplore. No one loves you anymore. And then 1431, Lucas Mosier, painter from Weil, master of this work, pray to God for him. So there's all sorts of interesting things. We know where he comes from. Uh, we know his name. Um, and we know that he is asking uh, that people who see this altarpiece pray for him. And then there's this interesting work. Was, what was the problem? Uh, did he feel that people did not appreciate his art? Uh, was there uh, some difficulty in artists finding works? Uh, was there some difficulty in artists finding commissions? Um, we don't know. Uh, why he painted this Weep Art Weep uh, inscription on his painting. But let's look at the painting. It's a very unusual subject in a sense. Uh, it's it has narrative scenes from the legend of Saint Mary Magdalene, uh, some of which are not so often reproduced. And so we suspect that there probably was not a lot of uh, works by this subject that he could draw from. So he's you know, having to sort of make up the iconography himself and make up his composition and, and ways of uh, showing the, uh, uh, the uh, journey of the, mage, uh, the, the journey of, of the Magdalene and her companions. Let me tell you a little bit about the story of Mary Magdalene. Uh, Mary Magdalene is mentioned uh, a few times in the Bible. Uh, she is the woman who first saw Christ after the resurrection. Uh, but she is identified with other women, uh, some not named in the Bible. And she probably wasn't all these people, <laughs> of course. Uh, but that's how the legend grew up. Uh, she became identified uh, with the uh, with Mary and Martha of Bethany rather than of Magdala. Uh, these are the sisters of Lazarus. And you may know the story of how Mary uh, sits at Christ's feet and learns from him while her sister Martha is out preparing the food. And Martha gets really upset because uh, she feels Mary is malingering. And then, uh, you know, Christ says, well, she has chosen the better part. Um, at... When, when her brother Lazarus dies uh, while Christ is away and, and he returns, um, you know, Mary of Bethany, who is identified with Mary of Magdala, uh, says to him, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Christ raises Lazarus from the dead. Um, she's also associated with uh, some other figures, um, the woman from whom demons were expelled. Um, and the woman who was ca caught in adultery and was going to be stoned. And then uh, Christ intervenes and he says, well, who, you know, let the person who is without sin cast the first stone. And she's saved. And then he says, go and sin no more. Uh, she's also 
was believed to be the woman who, uh, at the Feast of Simon, washes Christ's feet with her tears and dries them with her hair and anoints them with precious oils. And the apostles rebuke her and say, well, you know, you should have spent the money on the poor. And Christ said, the poor you will have with me always. She does this in anticipation of my burial, uh, which is a kind of prophesy, a prophecy of the death of Christ. So Mary Magdalene becomes the image of a sinner who becomes a saint uh, and is beloved of Christ and is uh, redeemed from her sinful life because of her sorrow, because of her penitence. And, you know, so many of the saints seem to be these, you know, we, we say plaster saints, these little perfect people, you know. And so I think it must have been a big relief to have a sinner who becomes a saint because she becomes a kind of model uh, for ordinary people who do sin uh, and uh, hope to be redeemed. So let's look at uh, the different parts of the story that we see in this altarpiece. At the top, we see the scene of the Feast of Simon, where uh, Mary is washing Christ's feet with her tears and drying his feet with her long, luxuriant hair. And then in the center, uh, there are some things that are totally non-biblical. Uh, these are from uh, the golden legend, from uh, the, the, uh, the legend or the story of, of uh, St. Mary. Evidently, you know, people really want to know what happened to her after the resurrection. And so a whole story grows up. Um, she, with her brother, her sister, and uh, as we'll see, two uh, clerics, uh, are condemned uh, for being Christians, and they are placed in a boat that has no rudder and no sail. And they're placed on the Mediterranean, and they are just supposed to, you know, be... Uh, die at sea as a, the boat is uh, uncontrollably, you know, goes wherever it will. Uh, instead, however, uh, presumably the hand of God uh, guides the uh, boat uh, across the sea and it lands at Marseille in southern France. And uh, Marseille had been a Greek uh, colony and then uh, became a very important Roman uh, community. So they are outside the walls of Marseille. It's envisioned as a kind of medieval walled city and nobody's going to let these strangers in. And so Mary appears to the wife of the governor uh, and basically tells her to let in these <laughs> these these, uh, these strangers, uh, and she listens. And then on the far our far right, uh, we see uh, the last communion of Mary Magdalene. Uh, the story is that uh, she went out into the wilderness where she lived for I think it's thirty years, but for years and years. Uh, she was taken up into heaven and fed on heavenly food because she fasted for all those years. And uh, that was how she survived. Uh, that image, which is not in this picture, uh, of uh, Mary, uh, they call it the Ascension of Mary Magdalene, Mary being carried up to heaven by angels and uh, completely clothed in her luxuriant hair that once was a... Uh, temptation, you know, of her beauty and, and now becomes a vehicle of her modesty. Uh, that's a very popular subject in uh, Germany and um, I've seen one in Poland. Uh, but um, that's not shown. It's referred to here. We'll see, we'll see a detail of this and we'll see that she is uh, in that form, but she's receiving her last communion on earth before she dies. Then down at the bottom, this little horizontal scene of the predella. The predella is the section of an altar piece that sort of holds it up so you can open it. It wouldn't just drag on the altar. Uh, 
And that bottom piece has Christ as the man of sorrows in the center. And on either side, it has a wise and foolish virgins, which is a um, parable that Christ tells uh, of the uh, wise virgins waiting for the bridegroom and uh, bringing extra uh, oil for their lamps. Um, and the uh, foolish virgins uh, didn't bring anything extra, so they, they run out of oil, they have to go get it, and then they're late for the, the ceremony and... Uh, uh, the bridegroom says, you know, you can't come in. You're denied entrance into heaven because you were not prepared. Uh, and so this is an allegory of essentially the last judgment. The legend of St. Mary Magdalene is told in uh, the Golden Legend, the Legenda Aura, uh, by Jacobus of Devorogeny, who is a 13th century priest. And he writes this uh, as a help to priests, but it becomes a very popular book. Uh, essentially, uh, the idea is that you know not all priests, not all parish priests, uh, were terribly well educated and scholars, and uh, so they needed some material on which to preach their sermons on various saints' days, and so they could uh, you know, refer to this uh, this book, the Golden Legend, or they could uh, uh, maybe even read the sections from it. Uh, uh, legend, incidentally, refers to something that we read. Uh, from the word for uh, reading in, in Latin. Um, so it's the golden reading, ascension, essentially. We, of course, have taken that, uh, that uh, word, legend, and made it into something that is, uh, yeah, probably not true, uh, but that did not carry that idea at all uh, in the uh, Middle Ages. Uh, so Mary is identified with a number of women in the Bible. Uh, of course, she is, uh, by name, uh, Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary of Magdala, who is the first person to see Christ after his resurrection. But she's also identified with some other figures. Um, the woman who was taken in adultery, uh, but rescued by Christ when he says to the people who are about to stone her to death, um, let him who is without sin throw the first stone. And then he tells her to go and sin no more. Uh, whose, which instruction she seems to have uh, followed. Uh, she's also identified with the uh, unnamed woman who washes Christ's feet with her tears and dries them with her hair and who anoints Christ with uh, feet with uh, precious ointments. Uh, she's rebuked by the apostles who say, oh, you should have spent that money on the poor. And Christ says, no. You know, don't you know? Don't rebuke her. I mean, it's, it's already done. Uh, but what he says is, she has done this, but in preparation of my burial. So it becomes a foreshadowing of the death of Christ. And then, she's also identified um, as Mary of Bethany, uh, which is another city of Magdala. Uh, Mary of Bethany is the sister of Martha and Lazarus. Uh, Mary of Bethany is the woman who sits at Christ's feet uh, and learns from him while her sister Martha is out uh, doing the preparations for the food. Uh, it's working in the kitchen, as it were, and uh, Martha rebukes Mary, who she feels is malingering, and Christ says, no, she has the better part. You know, she's concentrating on spiritual matters rather than you know, the everyday physical needs of the body. Lazarus was their brother, and he dies while Christ is not there. And when he comes to visit, uh, Mary says to him, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. And so Christ works the most amazing miracle. He calls Lazarus forth from the tomb and brings him back from the dead. And she's also uh, the woman who is... Uh, uh, who is possessed by devils and um, who is, is healed by Christ. Um, and in some versions of the story, uh, she is the woman of um, the wedding at Cana, the, the bride. Uh, and she's being married to John the Evangelist, only instead of you know, uh, staying and being her husband, uh, he leaves and goes and follows Christ. And uh, that's why she ends up... Uh, 
uh, as, a, as a prostitute. Uh, she has to support herself. Um, she's not always identified with that woman, uh, but uh, that's, you know, as I say, other figures uh, in the Bible are sometimes associated with Mary. This is Mary of uh, Mary Magdalene, not Mary the mother. Mary seems to be a very popular name. Okay, so here we're seeing the details. We see uh, Mary at the Feast of Simon, where she's washing Christ's feet with her tears and drying them with her hair. And um, at that time, the custom was for a host uh, to either wash the guest's feet or perhaps have his servants do it, uh, because of course the feet would be very dusty from traveling uh, and uh, in sandals. And uh, Simon failed to do that. And Mary, as a sign of her penitence, uh, does this with her own tears and her own hair. Close-ups here, some of the details. You can see that the figures turn in space. Uh, you have a, a, a nice sense that they're behind the table. The table is in proportion. Uh, you know, they all have uh, draperies that are modeled in light and dark. The drapery folds you know, suggest the figure beneath them. Uh, so you can certainly see uh, greater uh, uh, naturalism or realism developing. Now, as we look at these wings, um, one of the things we see, we often say that these figures always seem to be charming to us, uh, a little, little, perhaps a little naive or all like. But this is really interesting because of the interest in the setting. And we want to take a closer look at particularly the seascape and landscape behind it, uh, and also, of course, the cityscape. Um, the composition does seem to be less balanced. Um, there's, there's something awkward about the placement of the figures, perhaps, uh, in, uh, in, in the, the cityscape. Um, and that may be because these are very unusual scenes, um, and there may not have been uh, artistic models from which uh, the artist would draw. He may have made them all up himself, in which case he's very creative. So let's look first at uh, the way space is used. You have the defined physical space of the buildings, and you have, uh, for example, this little uh, porch on, on at the outside of the walls where they're they're sort of huddling under and just sheltering under because they nobody will let the strangers into the city. Uh, and then up at the top. Um, you have uh, a view into the bedroom of the uh, the governor of the city, and then of course this archway. It seems like another building with the uh, Mary Magdalene uh, receiving her last communion. We also see on the left this panoramic seascape uh, with these uh, distant uh, uh, bits of land uh, right up against the horizon. Now, that is something that is absolutely new in German art. You think about going from um, Master Bertram, Master Franca, uh, Master Franca would be his immediate uh, predecessor. And, you know, this is an incredibly spacious, uh, say, landscape, seascape. Uh, we think that it's the influence of Netherlandish art and, and perhaps of observation on the part of the artist. Uh, he wants to make something look real and place the sacred scenes not just against a gold background or a red background, uh, although he certainly uses the gold background that is traditional, uh, but also you do have this sensation of this um, distant space uh, that, you know, just goes on and on and on. And of uh, other, what, little ships sailing the seas as well. Uh, you might notice that he's trying to show you also the movement of the sea, these, these ripples, these waves. And here you see the figures. Uh, Martha, the sister of Mary, Lazarus, her brother, who is uh, now uh, that's her brother. Um, Maximum, who uh, was the uh, priest who had baptized Mary and Martha, it says, into whose care blessed Peter had entrusted Mary Magdalene. 
and uh, Sidonius, who was a man born blind and cured by Christ. And so these people uh, were Christians, and according to the legend, according to the story, uh, they were placed in this rudderless boat without a sail, with no oars, with no way to navigate, and just thrust into the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, they were supposed to capsize and die, but instead, uh, God takes them to Marseille. Uh, and here you have the close-up of some of the figures. Uh, you can see that they, uh, the, the, the men are clerics. <laughs> Um, and you can also see uh, that the women are, you know, quite well to do because they have these uh, beautiful uh, ripples uh, with uh, lots of uh, ruffles here, uh, which would be uh, uh, quite luxurious. Ah, right in the center, they're sort of lying down, uh, napping, <laughs> trying to get comfortable uh, at the city gates of Marseille where they are denied entrance. They can't get in. But Mary Magdalene works a miracle. And here she is appearing, a kind of vision, to the wife of the governor. So you have this uh, little uh, scene with uh, which we see through uh, open windows and you have the governor sleeping and his wife is uh, beside him but she's wakened up and she's uh, sort of in a, she's, she's sleeping in the nude except for her headdress you have to keep your ears warm of course when you're sleeping uh, they're not covered up by the bed clothes and uh, she wakes up and she is in a sort of prayerful position to show that she has seen this vision of the saint and uh, Mary convinces her to convince her husband uh, to let the travelers into the city, where I think they probably proceed to convert people to Christ. Uh, Mary, as we said, goes off into the wilderness. That's not really shown here. Uh, but she goes off into the wilderness, uh, lives for many, many years uh, on heavenly food. She's carried, here you see the angels who are holding her. Uh, as I say, a lot of times you'll see an image of Mary being carried up into heaven, and she, uh, she's completely covered by her hair. Uh, sometimes it's her beautiful hair is flowing down over her body and becoming a vehicle for modesty. Uh, sometimes it almost seems as though she's become uh, a, a wild woman and the hair is growing out of her body. I sometimes call these the Harry Marys, um, but they're, they're wonderful scenes. Um, now in this case, uh, Mary is uh, about to die and uh, she uh, is receiving her last communion. So she's been sort of miraculously brought in. I think in the story, uh, the priest actually is wandering through the wilderness and finds her. But here it's been transposed, almost like she's been brought uh, to his, his, uh, his church. And you'll also see the carving on the wall, uh, this uh, semi-nude figure and uh, the ape. Um, is this supposed to be uh, classicizing? You remember Marseille was a Roman city. Uh, the ape sometimes refers to such things as lust, uh, so perhaps it refers to the fact that uh, Mary Magdalene was able to overcome that. So this is what's going on. Uh, she retreats the wilderness as a penitent saint. Angels bear her to heaven seven times a day where she is fed on heavenly food. But before her death, she is miraculously, in this case, returned to Marseille to receive communion uh, from her old companion, Bishop Maximum. Now, what happens when you open <laughs> the altarpiece? When you open the altarpiece, you see sculpture. And uh, you have some painted wings with um, St. Martha and St. Lazarus, so the, brother, the sister and brother of uh, Mary Magdalene, according to the legend. And you have one of those statues of Mary Magdalene, the Harry Mary, uh, being taken up to heaven. They're called the Ascension of Mary Magdalene with all the angels supporting her. Uh, however, this is a 16th century statue. It's not the original statue. We're not sure 
But one possibility is that this statue, which is a bit earlier, it's the right time, uh, either by Hans Moltzer or by Moltzer's workshop, you say the Moltzer School. Uh, by school, they don't mean an academic institution, they mean the group of painters, or in this case, the group of sculptors uh, who are following that particular artist. Um, so um, could this statue of the Ascension of Mary Magdalene be the original one that uh, once fit here? As I say, we're not sure, but possibly. It shows Mary as uh, being carried. It shows Mary Magdalene being carried to heaven by the angels. She's shown as an ascetic saint, in other words, a saint uh, who mortifies her flesh, who you know doesn't eat, uh, you know, who punishes her body for her sins. Uh, she is clothed in her hair, as we said, and carried to heaven. Uh, and this is a very popular subject in German art. Uh, I want to talk to you about Hans Moltzer now. Uh, Hans Moltzer, uh, we don't know his birthday, but somewhere around 1400 to 1467. He is uh, recorded in 1427 as a citizen of Ulm in uh, Germany. And the records say that he is from Reichenhofen. And he seems to have been the head of a large workshop that turned out large altar pieces, both carved and painted, as we'll see, and also um, some small statues, such as this beautiful little trinity, uh, which is um, alabaster that has been polychromed and is in um, the Liebinghaus Museum in Frankfurt. Now, this isn't in your book, but I had really good pictures of it, so I thought I would show it to you. Um, this is, as I say, very small. Uh, it you know, shows uh, God the Father standing as this old man, and uh, what looks like I have a chess piece is the dove of the Holy Spirit. And then Christ is shown as the man of sorrows, or you could also say he's shown as the dead Christ, the crucified Christ. No, he's not alive here. He's, he's sort of uh, falling forward and he's being held up by uh, this angel. The type of image where you have the Trinity with God the Father, uh, oftentimes God the Father holding Christ or Christ uh, in front of him, uh, and it's the dead Christ or the crucified Christ, that is known as the Gnadenstuhl or in English, the throne of grace. And the idea is that God sent Christ to be crucified. And so here you see the Trinity essentially reunited after the death of Christ, but God offering his son as the sacrifice to save mankind. Now, we have panels from the, Würzbr the Würzbach altarpiece. Um, they're in Berlin, and the altarpiece has been disassembled. Um, these are the wing paintings. Uh, the altarpiece uh, to which they went, uh, the interior was probably a carved altarpiece, what we call a, a schnitzalter, a carved altarpiece. And um, that part has been lost, but these are the wings. And it is signed by Hans Maltzer on the frame. So this leads us to a question. Uh, was Hans Maltzer both a sculptor and a painter? Or did he have a great big workshop where he was sort of the, you know, the general contractor and he had painters and he had sculptors and, you know, he could put together these incredible uh, um, multiple media uh, altarpieces? All we know is that he signed it that came out of his workshop. Uh, was it his hand that painted them? Maybe, maybe not. And here's the signature. It says, pray to God. Remember, Moser had this, uh, remember Moser said the same thing. You know, pray to God. In this case, pray to God for Hans Moser of Reichenhofen, citizen of Ulm, 
who made this work in 1437. So we know where he came from and of course the city that he uh, spent his life working is where we have information. Now we're looking at uh, one of those scenes and this is a nativity. The nativity here is in the stable, uh, it's not in the grotto. And in this case I think sometimes you feel a little like the, the, the spatial construction is a little awkward. Um, but it does give a sense of space. You have the stable at an oblique angle, so we're looking into it. We're seeing uh, that one wall is half timbered. Uh, and uh, we can see the ox and the ass here uh, warming the child with their breath. Uh, so that does give a sense that there is this, uh, you know, actual physical space be that you can see into uh, behind Mary, behind the ox and the ass, they're extending into it. Uh, Joseph is out here, uh, very close to the center actually, kneeling, adoring the Christ child. Mary, is hands, her, her hands raised also. They are both adoring the child who is wrapped in swaddling clothes. And um, we even have some more figures. We have this uh, fence here uh, and a huge crowd of people uh, you know, looking over the fence uh, to adore Christ child. You know, who are they? Are these all shepherds? Uh, some of them are certainly women. Um, are they, uh, do they represent the people of Ulm or do they represent the people of Bethlehem? Do they represent, uh, like I said, do they represent the shepherds? Uh, could some of them refer to some of the people who paid for this? You know, some of the donors uh, be represented here? We just do not have enough information. We do not know. Um, now we are in the inside, as you can see. Uh, you know, we're closer to uh, Mary and Joseph. The forms are, are quite angular, uh, both the architectural forms and even uh, some of the shapes within the figures, which does suggest a, a certain tension. Uh, the figures are large, weighty, solid. Um, they are not particularly idealized. You don't have any of those international style courtly ladies with, um, you know, graceful draperies and elongated and uh, mannered poses. Uh, this Mary and Joseph, they are somewhat you might even say coarse or earthy. Uh, they are unidealized. Um, now, in your textbook, it calls the people on the outside of the fence the evil throng. And yet, some of the women are praying. Now they've got their hands up. So that doesn't suggest an evil throng to me. And so I wonder if they are intended to be the shepherds. Or, you know, could they be mankind or the sinners who are in need of Christ's salvation? I'll leave that with a question mark on it. You can decide for yourself. In this altarpiece, uh, we also have uh, the Passion as well as the Nativity of Christ. And so we see a scene of the Way of the Cross or Christ carrying the cross. And certainly see uh, the emotional tension here. Um, the space is very compressed. We have our gold background, but the figures, uh, and we see rows and rows of figures, but they all seem to be packed close. So we have this real sense of a crowd. And Christ, it seems to be weighed down by that heavy cross. Uh, Simon of Cyrene has just taken hold of it. He's going to help carry the cross. And you see a scene that you, you sometimes see in um, images of Christ carrying the cross, these little children picking up rocks and throwing them at Christ. And I mean, you know, so this just seems horrified. You know, little children, why would they be doing this? Well, the idea is that all mankind, even little children, are sinners. And, uh, you know, they're doing dastardly deeds. Uh, uh, they were sinners from birth, if you will, uh, because of the sin of Adam and Eve that was passed down to all of mankind. Uh, so, you know, everybody except the holy figures whom we see here on the, uh, you know, behind the cross uh, on our left 
uh, uh, the, the whole crowd seems to be made up of very evil people. Uh, some of them you see have grotesque faces. I'll show you in detail in a moment. Um, and Mary is standing erect. John is right next to her. So the holy women behind her. You know, they are the they are the calm, erect, upright people in this you know, mass of of evildoers. And as we've said before, these ugly, distorted faces are uh, suggestive of uh, cruelty. Uh, you know, they are the bad guys. They are evil. Um, there are a number of German devotional texts about Christ's passion, and they do seem to load on the torments. Uh, you know, what happened to Christ when he was in prison? Uh, what was going on with the crowning of thorns? Everything really shows that Christ, you know, was tortured horribly. And that becomes part of, of the devotion. Now, this is a narrative scene. It's just showing like, well, this is what seems may have happened. Um, and you're supposed to, of course, feel the sorrow for it. But, uh, you know, he's basically telling the story as well. And here is the resurrection from the Wurzbach, uh, Wurzbach altarpiece. Now, you'll notice that we only see one leg of Christ, and the other one seems to have, it, it should be there. I mean, it's not like it's be, you know, it's, it should be out of our view. It is down in the tomb. Christ is literally stepping through the sealed tomb. So we don't just see that the tomb is sealed. We see the seals on them. Uh, but we also see the actual coming forth from the tomb, this uh, miraculous um, solid matter going through solid matter. So here we're seeing something totally supernatural, in a sense, uh, the resurrection of the body of Christ as very physical. He's weighty, he's solid, uh, and he's coming forth. Uh, he's within one of these little uh, enclosed spaces, the golden background, the spindly trees, and uh, uh, you have that once again, this angularity and tension that seems to be part of um, Maltzer's uh, painting style. Um, you have a little bit of the space being tipped up so we can see the top of the sarcophagus, but the fence is limiting the depth. No panoramic landscapes here. Um, the forms of the figures, for example, the uh, sleeping soldiers, very angular, awkward positions. Um, and, of course, the ugly, evil soldiers. You know, we talked about a kind of expressionism uh, with the master of the Trayvon altarpiece in Bohemia. And, you know, the, that emotional impact does make people think of, uh, you know, that, you know, this idea of expressing the strong emotion through angularity and forms. So um, you could probably apply the word expressionistic to this as well. Although, there is some things naturalistic about it. He's not as interested in a naturalistic setting, but the figure itself of Christ is modeled in light and dark. Uh, and, you know, seems to be very bulky. So not as interested in the naturalistic spatial setting as Mosier, uh, but uh, still with some solid figures. And as we said, we don't know whether he was the painter as well as the sculptor, uh, or was he a kind of general contractor who put everything together. Let's look at some more of his sculpture, because we know he was a sculptor. Uh, this is a stone figure of Christ as the man of sorrows. And as you can see, it's right outside the doorway, the west portal, the main entranceway into Ulm Cathedral. And it is Christ as the man of sorrows. And Christ is suffering. He's pointing to his wound. 
And uh, as people would enter the cathedral, they would be reminded that Christ suffered for their sins in order to help save them. Now, the figure itself is a new kind of realism. It's very realistic. Um, you know, he, he looks you know, like he is suffering, uh, but he certainly looks very real. And uh, this, is, this is new in, in the art of the area of Germany, Schwabia. Um, and it suggests perhaps that Maltzer had some knowledge of the new naturalism that was taking place in Netherlandish and Burgundian art. So it's been suggested that he could have had an apprenticeship in either the Netherlands or Burgundy. Or possibly, um, you know, he learned his craft in Germany and then went on a, a wanderjahr, as we say, a wander year as a journeyman uh, and visiting different sites to see uh, more art. Uh, we don't know. It's speculation. You know, where did he get this new realism? Uh, did he develop it himself or no, is it the influence of uh, Netherlandish artists. Now think of people like Klaus Sluter, for example. Okay, just three different views. Uh, one shows you how dirty the uh, the statues get being outside uh, in the weather. Uh, the other is, of course, this uh, somewhat side view and then a uh, frontal view looking in. He also carved some beautiful uh, female saints. Uh, this is St. Ursula from the Sterzinger altar from the 1450s. Uh, we seem to have work uh, by Maltzer from various decades. Uh, the Man of Sorrows from uh, 1429. Uh, this uh, altar piece can be dated uh, to the 1456 to 58. Uh, these are uh, carved in wood, uh, lime wood, and they are polychromed or painted. And originally, the uh, female saints would have been on either side of a statue of the Virgin and Child, uh, but now the, uh, the altarpiece has been taken apart and the statues are in different uh, locations. And here you're seeing uh, this drapery folds, you know, that cover her body, uh, St. Ursula's body, and then she's holding up uh, a section of the mantle, and you'll see that it breaks in these kind of angular forms. And um, I'm showing you a picture here from uh, Roger van der Veen's uh, Columbo altarpiece, which uh, was in Cologne, and we, we now think it was maybe painted in the early years of the uh, 1450s, so maybe just, just about the same time or just before uh, Maltzer's altarpiece. Uh, so could he have gone to Cologne and seen this or someplace else and seen other Netherlandish art? But you can see those angular breaking uh, folds of the drapery. And uh, I was just looking for some other Hans Maltzer pictures on the web, and uh, this, is, uh, this is what I came up with, with a, a virgin and child and a uh, St. Mary Magdalene. The Mary Magdalene, it, it didn't say, but it looks like it could be from that altarpiece. Uh, this is in, <laughs> this is in uh, Frankfurt, uh, in the Liebinghaus Museum. And uh, I'm going to show it to you because I have you know, colored pictures that are better than the pictures that I have of the other things. Uh, it is lime wood. It is originally uh, polychromed. Uh, the hair was originally gilded, in other words, covered with gold leaf. Um, and it is a, a female saint. It may be, it has been suggested, that it is a Mary Magdalene. Uh, but she does not have an attribute. Uh, as you can see, one hand is broken off, and uh, it could have held something like an ungent pot, uh, which is the... Uh, attribute or object that identifies uh, Mary Magdalene. You can see the figure itself, it's very realistic. Uh, it seems to be based on observation. Uh, the female saint has her eyes downcast, just saintly, it's very quiet, she looks very um, she's, what's the word I want? She looks very pensive. 
It could be that this is from a crucifixion group, uh, or it could be just you know individual saints. Um, it's quiet. Uh, there's a slight turn to the body, but uh, mostly it's a frontal pose. And he's just uh, showing all sorts of drapery, the beautiful, graceful veil that goes over her head and falls down over her uh, shoulders and arms, uh, the drapery that's held back. You know, it's all sorts of layers of cascading drapery folds. And so we could say that with Maltzer, we could we see the introduction of what we often think of as Netherlandish naturalism into German sculpture. And you can also see that he is much more naturalistic with his sculpture than with the paintings that are attributed to him. And just to show you the, the contrast here, uh, here is one of those beautiful Shone Madonnas. Uh, they're dainty, they're courtly, the international style with this, the uh, courtly figures of Mary, uh, high Gothic, uh, a beautiful sort of uh, S-curve with the uh, hip, uh, uh, the hip shot position stretched out, uh, Christ uh, resting on Mary's hip, um, and this, you know, this very, very dainty face. Uh, she just looks like, you know, she could be a court lady. She could be the queen of heaven. Maltzer's female saint uh, does not share all of those tiny, dainty attributes. She looks very, very realistic, uh, and the draperies seem to be, uh, you know, very, uh, very solid and believable. Now, it does show that he's been observing. It may show that Netherlandish influence has spread to Germany. It may indicate that uh, Mozart at some point was in the Netherlands. We just do not have documentation to know, um, but certainly a very accomplished German sculptor of the new realism or the new naturalism.